Yeah, so welcome, Daktari. Welcome to PhD Stories. Yeah, this Thank is you. It's really good. It's a privilege and an honor to have you on this program or on this uh, show today. Uh, PhD Stories, for those who are watching, is just meant for prospective and current PhD students. Uh, just having people share their stories, their, how it's been for them, where those who are undertaking, those who are completed, so that if you're contemplating doing a PhD, um, whether locally or abroad, at least you can gain from the experiences. So please like the video, share with others, you know, and subscribe to the channel. So Karibu Sana, welcome, Dr. Gladys. Uh, maybe we can start by having you introduce yourself. Karibu. Thank you so much, Harry. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a privilege. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm always excited to talk about the PhD journey because yeah. I think many of us, I, it's a confusing journey sometimes, especially if what, before you get into it. Um, and even while you are at, while you are at it, uh, you want some tips and tricks on how to survive and thrive ETC. Yeah, yeah so my name is, my name is Gladys Chepkiring Teach. In terms of, I'll just give like really brief, brief uh, overview of my academic journey because I think that is the main focus for main focus of today's discussion. Yeah. So I studied in a local primary school. My school is called Lelai Bay Primary School, somewhere in in Nakuru County. And then after um, I did my KCP in two, 2004. After my KCP, I, I scored, and I think many people know me by the story of 298 marks. Wow. That was the <laughs> story I scored. And I, I have to emphasize, because I think we we, we have for form ones, the yes. new form ones, and class eights, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so just to emphasize that whatever marks you have, it's not the end of the world. Whether you passed, whether you failed, you can definitely do something about it uh, in your journey towards achieving your goals. So sure. anyway, with 228 marks, I went to high school in Masegals, Kipkelion, somewhere in Kericho, for those who don't know where Kipkelion is. From Kipkelion, I got 80 points of A-, minus. went to JQuat to do mechanical engineering. I really wanted to do mechanical engineering, mostly from my brother's influence. I think we can talk more about it later. And then at the end of JQuat, in my final year of, of, of bachelor's degree, and many people, when I share my story, people ask, is it possible to get a scholarship before you graduate? Mm -hmm. um, answer is yes. I got my scholarship. I, I just used my four transcripts because we were doing five-year course. Oh, so I was in my fifth year. I was in fifth year, used four-year four year transcripts and and Yes, and they liked my performance. So I got my scholarship finally of, of my, my engineering course at JQuat. So by, by the time I was clearing, we cleared 2014 December, I, I got confirmation of the scholarship November of 2014. So by the time we were clearing, I knew I was going to the UK at some point. Yes, so 2015, October is when I started my journey in the UK doing the PhD, which I think will be the main, main, main focus of today's discussion. Uh, yeah. And I was researching better ways of cooling jet engines or aircraft mm -hmm. engines. Mm -hmm. And then after that, in 2019, I completed my PhD, defended it, and then got a research, uh, postdoctoral research job at MIT. And so I crossed over the ocean and I uh, went to the US and that is where I'm now based. But I'm, I'm currently in Kenya taking a long vacation and, and doing all sorts of things around here. Wow. Wow. That's really interesting. Very inspirational. And uh, I actually just learned about the 298. I shot my leg. There was a video I was watching about you being interviewed. And I think it's really interesting, you know, 298, then you go to high school, then Oxford, MIT. What are the secrets? Is it, were you just lucky? <laughs> what, what would you say about that? <laughs> Mm, definitely luck, luck might, might have played a role, uh -huh. but, but well, uh, you know, they, they say luck only favors the prepared ones. Uh -huh. So I also, know that, I also know that I did a lot of hard work on uh -huh. my side and also shout out to my parents who uh -huh. I think at that age, and I keep, I keep emphasizing, so if you watched my video, I keep emphasizing that where at, at class eight, 
the 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 vision or or the, where you are headed or what is life or what is next i think at that age very few students can can make sense of life really yeah, and true. i think mostly parents guardians and teachers who are kind of transporting that child to get to their goals and in my case it was exactly that for sure so I want to say like the transformation that I got from 298 marks to where I am. Obviously, they were number one series of little steps. I didn't get to 298 to MIT directly, right? Yeah, I got sure. to 298, then I went to Masigal's first of all. And I normally like saying dreaming in steps. So it was like little steps. They were like, they were big at the time, but they were manageable. Yeah. And then, um, and obviously, so just those focusing on those little steps and then that was number one and then number two is just shout out to my parents and my teachers because really they saw potential in me mm -hmm. and they were like even with 298 we can see we can see you doing we can see you performing well so shout out to, to them for sure okay okay interesting yeah. Yeah, 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 and that's really good. Uh, at least having support. I mean, and I think we'll be talking later ab later on about the support system that you had and um, really assisted you. But tell us about the scholarship to Oxford because I I think this is something that is really interesting to many people and uh, those who are yet to pursue their PhD, they are wondering how can I get you know this scholarship or something related. Mm, scholarship to Oxford. Now, I have a lot of stories around that. And I think one thing is, I feel like most of our students are unaware. Most of our students are unaware of opportunities. And I kind of blame our education system a bit. <clears throat> and I also, I don't know what else to blame really, but I feel, like our, I feel like things are changing so fast in the world and we need to make our students aware. So, um, how I got to know about the scholarship for, for myself, for instance, and I mentioned it was in my final year of my undergrad, it was through a classmate, a friend who he knew he wanted to go abroad and he was applying, he was actively applying for scholarships. And just because of close proximity to that person, I got to know about the scholarship. And then I asked, and then I asked more questions about it. Like, how do you get it? Like, is, is it possible to just apply for something um, to just apply for a scholarship online and someone gives you this money and you don't pay anything. And then him teaching me just like, yeah, um, the whole process of applying for scholarships. So anyway, I think for for students, I mean we all we all we we have to we have to um we have to recognize that we we have different journeys and I know mm -hmm. some students will just finish um, undergrad and go direct to industry, which is okay, or finish undergrad and, and start a business uh, and all that. But for those who want to, to further their studies, to do master's and PhD, there are so many, there are a ton of scholarships out there. And I think we have to do, I don't know how, the, how best we can dissemi disseminate this information. I don't know how best we can let the students know that there are these scholarships available. So for instance, I think it's on page 29 of my the PhD book, which we'll mm -hmm. talk about. Yeah. I tried to list, yeah, mm -hmm. I tried to a couple of websites, yeah. um, and one of which I used to get my scholarship to Oxford. So for for those students looking for scholarships, they can they can just get that book and yeah. and, and and, and, and get those links, yeah. So there's there's so many. Or even just going to Google, actually. Just go to Google and say master scholarship, fully yeah. funded master scholarship abroad or even within Kenya. Or go to link, LinkedIn and post and make a post and say, uh, I have a desire to study in this and this country. Anyone with any suggestions yeah. on scholarships. And people are normally kind and they'll share, they'll share information and insights. So put yourself out there, ask questions, and be proactive. I think yeah. that is the way to get info, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. And actually on page 29, I can see a list of uh, the websites. And it's interesting because the other person whom I interviewed also for PhD stories was telling me about how she got information from a friend, you know, something a friend was sent on WhatsApp and it ended up benefiting her. And you're also saying the same that a friend uh, giving you information. So I think there's really a lot of information out there, but many of us are ignorant. And I think even the Bible says, my people perish <laughs> for lack of knowledge. I think there is a lot that needs to be done. 
But uh, I think one other interesting thing that I find and maybe I got to learn from, uh, well, earlier on, I, I, I know some people are not aware. How do you move? You know, it's possible to actually move from bachelor's to PhD. That was really interesting. Maybe tell us about that. <laughs> Oh yeah, that is also, I, I tell you like all this information, people mm -hmm. have a ton of information and insights. I just don't know what the best way to, maybe writing a book is one of the yeah, ways. Yeah, sure. And so people read books, maybe is one of the ways you can learn about all these all these possibilities. Yeah, so it's, it's actually possible. I know for engineer, engineering for sure in the UK, and I also know it depends on which country. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm speaking with the knowledge of the UK and in the UK, and I'm also speaking with the knowledge of Oxford University. I don't know if other universities are a bit, I don't know their requirements for, for doing a PhD, but I know, I understand most universities in the UK would be okay you doing a PhD if you have a strong grade from undergrad. Yeah. So you, you even US, you just by the way, even some US colleges and universities, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that is, I think, the best person to, because uh, for, yeah, I, 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 it was actually through the same friend who made, he told me it's possible to do a PhD. And then I ended up scheduling a, a Skype call with my potential advisor, a professor I'd identified in the, through the website of the university. And so we did a Skype interview or a Skype catch up call. And I asked him if that was possible. And then he just asked me a couple of questions. And then he was like, yeah, I think you are actually good, good to go. Just come and look for me. We settle on a topic and then you can start researching. So it's, it's, it's possible, yeah. Wow, interesting. Yeah, so that, that can really uh, be quite helpful. But tell us about, uh, there's something you mentioned uh, in one of the chapters or one of the sections about feeling like an imposter. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. can speak, speak about it <laughs> yeah um so imposter i think for those who don't know is imposter syndrome is just yes. this feeling just this feeling that you don't deserve mm -hmm. what you've worked hard to get or you don't deserve you get a promotion and you're like oh my god did they miss something will they get to know that i'm not actually the person they think or you get an award or you get a scholarship, like I got road scholarship. And, and at some point, I think when I got road scholarship, I actually didn't know, know how, how big the scholarship name was until I was in the UK. And every time you mentioned that you were a road scholar and everyone was turning their heads and you realize mm -hmm. it's a big scholarship, right? Mm -hmm. and, then, and, and, and those times I was feeling so small, you know, I was like, oh my God, I just from undergraduate, I did not know the research, you know, there is a research lingo. I did not know how to be like a research student. And I was feeling very insecure. I think insecurity is another, I don't know if it is a symptom of imposter syndrome, but I felt a lot of imposter syndrome in my um, first initial months of my PhD, initial months of my PhD, I felt a lot of insecurities. And I think majorly it was just coming from the fact that um, number one, I was coming from a bachelor's degree, like I mentioned, with barely any research experience. And I was mm -hmm. all over in like what, what world's best university trying to do a PhD. And so I, there were just so many unknowns and that kind of made, that kind of wasn't the imposter syndrome or insecurities that I was feeling. And then number two, just being, and I think I've read, reading from other people's stories, when you are the only one who looks different in a community, so be it you are the only one looking black, uh, the only one who is black in a, in a white dominated uh, uh, community, mm -hmm. or you could be a Muslim in a predominantly Christian community, you could be a man in a, I don't know, I don't know if, if that works, <laughs> but normally if you are a woman, Mm -hmm. um, I can really talk about my experience being a woman in a predominantly male community or male environment. So, so I was just saying number two points, uh, the reason why I think imposter syndrome was showing a lot is just being a minority in a group. Um, I was, I was, I, I think I was the only one, I was the only black woman actually for about three years from 2015 wow. all the way to, 
I think 2018 is when we got another black woman joining our lab. And people don't understand. It's only if you've, be, if you've been a minority in, um, in a community, you understand how, inse- how, how, how that insecurity or imposter syndrome can play. It can so intimidate those things. Those yeah, those were the main things for me, the main contributor for, yeah. for the insecurities I was feeling. Yeah. And I think it also didn't help um, that the people would sometimes make you feel out of place. You know, talk about the, would I say racism or some kind of treatment? You know, this one time you were mistaken for a dress. <laughs> I don't know, you can yeah. tell us about that. Many times. <laughs> Many times, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's so sad. Uh, so I, so the, the, the moment that I talk about in the book is we were in a conference in Europe, somewhere in Europe, I won't mention the name. And I think for, for any woman or person of color in aerospace, it's male dominated, it's white mm. male dominated. Yeah. And yes, and then, so we were in this conference mm. and I think just like many other conferences I've attended, you are always kind of scanning the room to see if there is anyone else who looks like you and normally they are rarely anyone. But anyway, in this conference, so it was like white male dominated conference. At that point, I think I was starting to get used to being in those environments where you feel like the, the only one who is different. Uh, but anyway, so that morning we were walking with my friends and we, uh, I, was, I wanted to go to the front, to the front row. And then uh, someone just finished their, their coffee oh. and then handed me their cup. And then, you know, there was, there was kind of momentary kind of confusion and then for me, it kind of, I just kind of knew that he assumed that I was one of the wait- waitresses. Um, and then I, at that point, I even didn't communicate a thing. I just removed my badge from the back and then I put like this. And then he apologized, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. But anyway, uh, just, to, just, to say, just to say, it's very, it's very lonely mm. when you are a minority in a group of people, very yeah. lonely. And, and yeah. those situations can definitely happen a lot. Yeah, that's quite quite sad, and I, I I just tried when I was reading this, I'm just feeling oh oh no, <laughs> I mean, for someone to realize this is a PhD engineering, and here you're being mistaken for a waitress, you know. Yeah. And anyway, so yeah. maybe just speak to someone who could be feeling, uh, who could be experiencing that in, imposter syndrome. Maybe they are watching and they're thinking, wow, that's me. I'm in that space. I'm feeling out of place. Maybe even um. I don't have much research experience or when I meet with the people, they talk about their work experience. I've never had this. I don't know what encouragement you'd have for someone like that. Um, yeah, we do feel there was a research out there that, yeah, like I mentioned, mostly minority people feel this imposter syndrome thing. And it's normally the research, I think they say, uh, yeah, it's mostly like if you're a minority in a group. So two things from my experience that I think can help you manage or mitigate or continue working and being sane, regardless of these insecurities and imposter syndrome. Number one is just recognizing that this is normal. Mm -hmm. And like I've explained, the reason why probably you are feeling a lot of, or or why imposter syndrome is heightened, the reason is you are just, you're just, you're just minority in that group. And so every time you, you mess up, you, you kind of want to carry the entire population in your shoulder. So for instance, for me, no one told me to carry Africa or to carry black women <laughs> on the shoulder, but it just kind of happened. It just kind of happened naturally. Like someone yeah. would ask about my hair. I would be like, oh, is that is that like how your hair looks like? And I mean, not only my hair, but like, you know, black women hair, you know? Um, or if I, sometimes when I wanted to present something and I was hesitant, I spent ages and ages preparing presentation because I just felt like, oh my God, if I, if I miss something, these guys will think students from Africa mm-hmm. don't know how things, you know? So those, I don't know if other people feel like that, but you so are, many You are times, carrying Africa and black women and all that. Yeah, you tend to. If you are a minority in a group, you tend to carry... You, you tend to, to try and represent your tribe and you want to represent them very well. And it's a lot of burden. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that kind of heightened imposter syndrome. And so I was saying just number one way of managing imposter syndrome is recognize that that is natural. As long as you are a minority in a group, imposter mm-hmm. syndrome might 
might be heightened. Not everyone will feel like so, but many people will feel like so. And so just know that it's a normal, it's a just, it's just a normal evolutionary kind of thing uh, mm -hmm. to feel like in such kind of environment. And then number two is, and I think I write it in the book, and I really appreciate it now. I still feel imposter syndrome. It, the same thing happened when I went to MIT. MIT is, a, is another big school. Yeah. And in a, coming from Oxford, I still felt imposter syndrome. For instance, when I got the postdoctoral position, as a, and I was like, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at MIT. I didn't believe it. Like, I, I was just feeling insecure about it. Like, when I was introducing myself, I felt insecure about it. But what kept me going is that um, and this is the second point, is that um, sometimes why we feel imposter, like imposters is because we, 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 we feel, you're still learning. You are learning. So you've not, you've not grasped you, uh, the content mm -hmm. of whatever. So for instance, so um, first year of my postdoctoral research at MIT, and also first, the first few months or first years of my PhD at Oxford, those who are wearing imposter syndrome were at a, at a highest level. And then it just kind of, I don't know, it just kind of, it, it, did, not disappear. it did not disappear totally, but kind of just waned out. Mm -hmm. Or rather, maybe I no longer paid attention, but mostly because I now went deep into research and I was starting to be an expert. And I could, I could stand in as much as I was shaking and scared. I knew what I was talking about. And someone asked a question and I can answer them. And somehow it makes you confident and you are like, all right, I'm actually, I actually belong. I actually know what I'm doing. And so the second point I was trying to make or trying to emphasize is when you feel imposter syndrome, most of the time also is when you are at the beginning of learning. So at the beginning mm -hmm. of your PhD, or the beginning of that new job, of that promotion, everyone is like, oh my God, is this, is this the person for that job? And you're also wondering, gosh, did they Am make I the a one? <laughs> Am I the one? And yeah. I think it's now. So before you grasp your content, um, mostly it's like the beginning of your journey, beginning of whatever thing you are doing, that imposter syndrome will always be there. And then it's just kind of, yeah, uh, weighing. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And the, I don't know, I don't know what page that is, but I talk about the four stages of, um, mm -hmm. of from, from, yeah, the four learning stages where in the beginning you, you actually don't know what you don't know. <laughs> and then but uh, i mean that is okay because you will feel you will look stupid when you answer questions but it's okay because you don't know what you don't know yeah. and then the second stage is you now start realizing there are so many concepts you don't know and you become so insecure about that and i think that is the the, the early stages of phd when you start reading re literature and you realize people have, have, have done ton of research <laughs> and you ask yourself what am i adding to this video <laughs> Yeah. And that is when the imposter, that is when the imposter is like now shooting high. So anyway, record. Sorry, and I imagine at that point, if it's not, if you're not careful, you can actually drop out of the program. Yeah, because you become overwhelmed, mm. and and you are I'm nothing. I'm adding nothing here. Mm. Yeah. So just because you are insecure, but you are actually adding something because yeah. of you are you are coming from a different perspective and mm. upbringing. So you definitely add something. So anyway, yeah. th those two things. Realize it's a natural thing, and especially yeah. if you are a minority student or mm -hmm. a minority person in a group, it might insecurities might come up a lot. Mm -hmm. And then number two, when you are at the beginning of beginning, just natural, it's gonna come. Just, just hang on there. Don't be yet. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Wow, that's really interesting, and I think um. It will help. And, and uh, this is not just for those who are, you know, in those big universities. I think there's also the perception of PhDs, this big thing. And I, there's a quote, actually, you mentioned somewhere. And I like, I think, page 665, you say, you don't need to do all the research or solve all the problems to earn a PhD. Sometimes the best thesis are completed one. I, I think I liked that. Yeah. Because sometimes we have this mindset of PhD, you know, I want to solve you know, one problem. <laughs> yeah. So. You want to win the Nobel Peace Prize while uh -huh. doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it becomes a problem. But also yeah. you mentioned that the PhD is a very personal journey. I don't know what you meant by that, that when you're in this PhD and forget about even what was the motivation, but what does it mean that this is a very personal journey? 
Oh, it just means exactly that. Like mm-hmm. it is, it is unique to each person. So we, we, the same year when I started my PhD, I think we were like maybe four, four of us who, who kind of were le- really close friends and we were supervised by one, one supervisor. So there okay. were like three guys and myself. And in as much as we were under one supervisor, we were researching pretty much close, closely related uh, concepts, but our journeys were totally different. So one guy was from Australia and I think the other two guys were from the UK, uh, was coming from Kenya. And just the fact that I'm, I'm Kenyan and my training in Kenya, my accent from Kenya, my looks from Kenya, it just, it, it, it just, it, it just makes the entire journey different. So, yeah. uh, and also my, my, uh, my, what's the name, my perspective on things and not only anything else outside research, but also perspective on research. So it, it tends to, I, I think, so the reason why I say it's personal is because we all, we, we all come from, we all come from different fields. Oh, another, another example is we, we all study different things in undergrad. Yeah. Some from physics, some from aerospace. I was coming from mechanical, and just just that foundational knowledge. We also had like different foundational knowledge, uh, knowledge coming into this PhD, and also what we all of us ended up doing different stuff when we finished. So one went to banking. I went to research, post-structural researching immediately. The other guy went to I think he went to an uh, uh, he went to industry. So the reason why I say it's personal is when you, if you are preparing to, to start a PhD or if you are in the beginning stages of PhD, I want you to, I want you to, I want you to refuse the temptation to follow the crowd. We are no longer, we are not in primary school and we are not in secondary school anymore. Mm-hmm. The journey is different. And so the reason why I say this is if you want to be an assistant professor, I, I know like in the US, uh, like right now, if I want to be an assistant professor, I can almost get it. So, for instance, if I wanted to be an assistant professor, if my if my mind was in that uh, in, in that space, from from day one of my PhD, I should be thinking about publications. I should be thinking about building skills that will make me a good professor, right? And then someone else, like my friend, he knew he did not want to be in academia, and he mm-hmm. wanted to go to he wanted to go to industry. And so in that case, you can, yes, publish papers, but you, you don't have to publish different. as many. Yeah, you don't have to publish as many as the person who wants to be a, an assistant professor, for instance. So anyway, so the reason why I really emphasize this is I followed the crowd and I am honest in the book for a while until I realized our journeys are personal and yeah. they are very unique. Yeah, where you are coming from is very different. Where you are headed is very different. And yeah. so just refuse the temptation to follow the crowd and realize that the journey is, is personal. Yeah. And I yeah. think this, this includes the aspect of even reading for your PhD. I remember when you're talking about your lab experience where sometimes you'd feel like, I mean, I'm not gaining anything. Let me go to the field. And then you sometimes would feel guilty leaving the lab. Yeah. Maybe you could just mention that. No, that is also, so for, like I mentioned, I, I, I followed the crowd for a while until I realized, you know what? I'm done. If it means I'm gonna take, and I actually took one year more than most of my colleagues. Most of my colleagues finished in three years. I finished in four years. I don't regret it because at some point I was like, if it means one year extra, because I'm wasting time, according to some people, you are wasting time going to the field. For mm-hmm. me, it wasn't wasting time. For me, it was really important. My soccer and track, track and field, I was doing 400 meter, meter hurdles. And for me, it was really important, the success in the field, it kind of just fed the energies in the lab. And yeah. also just, I don't know about anyone else, but somehow I'm learning that to feel, to somehow feel like a good human being and, and a useful <laughs> human being planet, it doesn't have to come from your PhD. Oh, it, yeah. can come, it can come from your hobbies. Yeah. And so for me, for me doing well in, in the outside uh, lab, Give me it actually gave me that confidence that I can I can achieve something. I can yeah. I can achieve this and this. And so even when things were not working in the lab, it kind of instead of feeling like useless human being, which I still felt like useless human being, 
But sometimes you remember yesterday, I actually, I actually won a medal or I actually got this award and it kind of helps you to just balance. Otherwise, yeah. I feel like you just go into rabbit hole or feeling like your, your experiments are failing, your yeah. computer situations are failing and therefore you are a failure because it's mm -hmm. a natural to, yeah. to, to go. Yeah. Thank you. I think people need to know that you are, uh, you know, an athlete participating in track and field events, you know, all through uh, your PhD program. And that's really interesting. Uh, there's also the bit about your PhD advice. I think we call them supervisors over here, PhD supervisors. And one of the things or one of the components that really contribute to the success or really the failure of a PhD is your advice. And maybe you can tell us your experience. So oh, totally, totally, totally. So advisor or supervisor, I think we called we called we called our, um, our professors supervisors as well. So according, were you choosing yeah, them? For uh, example, were you? Uh, is it some? Did you have to approach them to supervise you, or was it distributed department? How how does it work in the system you are in, and then the relationship? Hmm. Mm. This this goes to this to the point. So while I'm answering this, I want us to appreciate the fact that, like we mentioned, the journey this journey is personal and unique to each one. So yeah. my journey for instance, my journey to getting an advisor is very different from everyone else. Yeah, uh, different from my friends and and like that. And also maybe can it will also vary actually from country and also from university. Yeah. So this is how I got my advisor. After so, in my case, the road scholarship application is a bit different. So you apply for the scholarship, you get the scholarship, and then the scholarship helps you get admission. And so when I was applying for admission to the University of Oxford, I already had scholarship, and I feel like that kind of changes the landscape a little bit because you have funding. Because okay. I think funding is another major issue for research students. Because yeah. advisor would be asking you, do you have money? And if you don't have a money, it's kind of you are a burden. Because now we have to look for money for you. And if you if they don't have money, then it's a it's a challenge. So anyway, so from that's what I'm saying, my my journey or my situation can be a little bit different from many other people, mostly also because because of that, um, because of the scholarship thing. So anyway, so after getting the scholarship, and then when I decided now I, I was going to jump into the deep end of the swimming pool and, and choose PhD. The next step was, and this again was this classmate, cla it was an idea of this classmate of mine, right? So he, he told me, you know, you can actually just apply blindly to the University of Oxford and say, this is the research area you are interested to do. And then I don't know if I had done that, I don't know how they would assign me an advisor. But anyway, his suggestion was a better way to go about it is go to the University of Oxford website go to the Department of Engineering Science. That was the department where I wanted to go. And then I wanted to pursue uh, a research in thermofluids. Thermofluids is a field of mechanical engineering. Um, that was my, my area. I do not know exactly, that was just my passion. I do not know exactly what project that I wanted mm -hmm. to do. I just, I was interested in thermofluids. And so I went to thermofluids field um, under engineering science, and then just search for these professors who are researching things, who are researching projects under thermofluids. And then I found a couple of them, I think maybe three or four that I've, based on their pictures, they look friendly. <laughs> and, um, I think that, that is also something that people underestimate. Yeah. Anyway, the main thing was, I was just reading what they researched and, 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 and they were researching thermofluids related projects, but also, I have a feeling that the pictures also kind of played a role. <laughs> it, yeah. so, so it does, so it does. Serious. This one looks friendly. So my advisor, I think in his picture, he's actually, he's actually smiling sort of, and he's the director of the lab. And he looked really friendly from the picture. Anyway, so I sent this email. <laughs> I sent these emails and I write in the book. Yeah. Those emails, but I tell you, when I look back now, I cringe. They were poorly written emails. Like the structure of the emails, the eye, the eye, the, mm -hmm. the professionalism, the image. It's all right. It wasn't professional. Anyway, that, the reason why I mentioned that is most of those professors never bothered to even reach, even me in my situation, I'm not a professor, but I don't think I will even pay attention to such an email. It was just not professionally done. But 
this one professor reached out. Up to this day, actually, I, I asked him when I, I was completing my PhD, because I, I was like, I, my email was just poorly written. Why did you even give me attention? And then he said, it just like, just intuition. It was like, this student looks promising. Let me just take a, a, a huge <laughs> leap of faith. And that is what he did. It was just like a, it was just a bet, really. It was a bet. Yeah. And that is how I got, uh, that is how he replied my email. And then I was candid enough to say, I'm interested in thermoflit. I have no project in mind. And I have, bare, I, I don't have research experience. And he was like, cool, no worries. Let's have a, let's have a Skype call to chat more and then see if you maybe need a master's before you start a PhD and okay. all that. And anyway, and we Skyped, we Skyped a few weeks later and he was like, you know, I think you are a good candidate for, for PhD. Oh, wow. Just come look at me and start the research. So that is how, that is how I landed with my advisor. Yeah. And then we applied, he helped me draft and read and, and correct my proposal, which was mm -hmm. very simple. It was just like one page. Yeah. We, and that is a thing. Like, and wow. I know in other fields, maybe social sciences, yeah, proposals yeah, yeah. are both. It's a I'm whole proposal. Sure. <laughs> Mine was about 30 pages. I mean, you write a whole proposal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In my mind, when, when I was told to, to submit a PhD research proposal, I was thinking like, this cannot be less than 50 pages. Yeah. And then, this is University of Oxford. So this yeah. proposal has a top most <laughs> proposal. Anyway, to my surprise, it was just one A4. One wow. A4 page. Wow. And that was and it's this advisor who helped me, who helped me like narrow down to basics and, and make it really strong to make a strong case for what I wanted to research. And we had an amazing relationship. Wow. He, I talk about it all the time. I also have, I have, a, a, I have another book. It's called The Bold Dream. Mm -hmm. and I'd love to read that as well. Me. Yeah. So every time, every time I'm talking about my academic journey, I don't think I can really conclude before, without mentioning uh, Professor Professor Peter, because he, he he made a huge, yeah, he made he, he, he made impact impact. It was really impactful. Yeah. Um, yeah, in gu guiding me through the research process and just being really patient, because I was yeah. I was <clears throat> from negative side of the scale. Yeah. So would you yeah. say? Is it the fact that he was patient and of course he took a gamble with you at the beginning are there maybe two other qualities that you say you know he was a great person as a supervisor or advisor what was it that stood out for him i mean you've talked about his patience and i think sometimes uh there's this temptation of this is this looks like an expert he's published so widely in the field i think this one will be so good i don't know <laughs> mm. I, again we, we let's continue emphasizing <laughs> that um, advisor student relationship will be very there is no one that is similar to another yes. just because we are different as human beings right mm -hmm. even you would be really surprised some of my colleagues didn't like his supervision um whatever uh, that, that no. program. yeah and i think i don't know maybe because my personality personally I like to be, I don't like to be told. So if I make a mistake, if you tell me, if you tell me, Gladys, that is bot. Okay, I, I don't want to cast. <laughs> like that is that is that is useless things you are doing. You you will not. If you if you, I don't know. If you go that way, you I I get demoralized. So personally, I like to be told, Wow, you've actually done an amazing job because you've done A B C D. But don't you think if we did this way it would be different that is how i like to be given feedback some mm -hmm. of my colleagues are like don't waste time uh, uh don't 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 waste time trying to give me positive just go direct tell me <laughs> tell, tell me where the problem on. is <laughs> tell me where the problem is tell me you can yeah. do abc right to do that yeah. and that is it like, don't tell me don't try and um and flatter me and all that <laughs> yeah anyway so personally, I liked his, and so I think because of my personality and how mm -hmm. I liked to get feedback, yeah. I was grateful because, because he was, because he, yeah. So maybe, maybe just because of my personality, I don't know. But yeah. also I like to say, and I have to acknowledge that some advisors, just because yeah. of their personality and whatever, 
they can be nasty. Like you can mm -hmm. be the best students, but they will be the, the nastiest uh, professors you will ever meet. Because yeah. whatever, there could be things going on in their lives or yeah. just because of their personality. Um, another thing that I keep saying, and somehow I feel like maybe our relationship was positive because don't forget that this is a relationship. I mean, it's not romantic relationship, yeah. but it's a relationship. And just like any other relationship with your mom, with your dad, with your siblings, just think of any relationship you have in your life, right? What things do you do intentionally to grow yeah. and nourish a relationship, right? Communication, being thoughtful, for instance. Um, so, for instance, so I, I'll give an example. Um, some days I knew, I knew certain days of the week he used to take um, his kid for his daughter for training somewhere. And then knowing knowing that he's busy or he's, it's like family time, I, I would try and respect that. And occasionally if I needed feedback, I would, I would request there were days actually, I was like, oh, I need urgent feedback, but I know you are driving to, to, to take your kid somewhere. Yeah. Could I join you? We discuss this thing while you drive there. And he was like, yeah, come on, bring, bring, your, bring your laptop. Oh, wow. And literally, he was driving while I'm going with number one and asking and asking feedback, right? Wow. So just to say, it doesn't have to be office meeting. Yeah. Um, as a student, I think you, you have to be also, what's the name? Remember, you are the one in need here. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are they help you, but the, you are the one in need. And so you have to be proactive in terms of learning the person, learning their personality, learning yeah. how they like to operate and then trying to be thoughtful. So yeah. things like those, um, meetings, doesn't have, they don't have to be, meetings don't have to, to happen in the office. You can be innovative on how okay. you can meet depending on the advisor's mood, personality, and Styles, things like that. Yeah, and things like, wow, wow. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, and especially yeah. that, that I, bit I, of, I yeah. Uh, while I'm saying this, um, I feel really lucky saying this because mm. not everyone and say that they had a very good relationship with their advisor. Yeah. And I, I, I say that acknowledging that they, 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 you could be the best student, but yeah. they're still not. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Hope Interesting. Can, for people who don't have very good advisors, I hope, and I think most universities, they have a way to go around it. Uh, maybe changing, you can even change departments or change change departments or talk to department people and, and see if you can change, change the advisor. Advice. <laughs> yeah, change subjects if you're not too in because mm -hmm. I know from experience advisor advisor can make or break you. For, yeah, true. For, for sure. sure. For sure. True. Yeah. Wow. wow. I know we can discuss that on and on and on. Maybe we just we we are, we are almost coming to an end. But talk about the support system because I think this is really important when you're working mm. with PhD and you talked about uh, this has been a four year journey. So you say life doesn't stop. I think you also mentioned in the book that life doesn't stop so that you can focus on the PhD. Where does the support system, where do they come in in your journey? My support system, I want to say, were in two major categories. So the people in the university or people who were like close to my research and yeah. then people outside my research. And so those people who are like research close would be my advisor, would be my colleagues. We used to do like discussions sometimes or like mock presentations before real presentations. And they really, that is, I consider that like support. Um, and then also just like, um, I, the, I needed to write a MATLAB code to do something in the lab, but uh, another student had almost similar similar code and them just like taking time to teach me or like give me part of their code so that I can tweak around. Uh, I, that is enormous support. And I, I wish that for everyone doing research that you get supportive colleagues in the lab who you can, others is the loneliest journey. So I, I, I hope you can get people to like discuss your research and share materials. Uh, so that is how my like research related support uh, came in. Yeah. And then outside the lab, uh, be intentional, especially for guys going abroad, be intentional about forming a community of people 
you are comfortable and you are free and you you feel home make your home away from home be intentional about that so for instance somewhere during my phd we just like grouped uh, i think four of us or three of us and we rented an entire house and oh, wow. we cook meals occasionally especially during winter and then just play some bongo some diamond and dance and some make some pilau some ugali and you feel like you are at home um so I, for me that support system at oxford like the guys the the kenyan guys or friends outside the lab the guys who live with me were my major 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 support system and then also just people your family because uh, you get to call them hopefully you have a good relationship uh, one or all of your family members i feel like they can also keep you grounded and keep you feeling that you belong and you are cared for and you are important because sometimes phd can make you feel useless mm -hmm. so you need that support system so for me those were like my really major major support systems okay okay and i think there's um you mentioned an incident um and this was really sad when you lost your brother at some point and uh it, if it weren't for your support system i'm sure the journey would have taken a, a different you know trajectory mm -hmm. you can mention that briefly especially I, I say that because there are people who somewhere along their phd journeys things happen you get separated from your spouse you know you lose a loved one and how to maneuver you know how to get out of that mm. my uh, and i write i write it in the, the phd journey book that losing my brother was transformation it just brought some transformation in my life uh, that was in 2017. I uh, passed on 2017, sometime in July, and it was actually those housemates, the Kenyan, the Kenyan guys. We were we were co-sharing an apartment. Um, my family called called them to break the news to me. So you can actually see like tangible ways where your support system can come. So that night they just cooked a nice meal. What they ordered in, even they are blurry. I can't remember exactly, but I just remember them being in one place at one time, which was a, a bit weird because we were always in and out, in and out, unless it was a weekend. And then they told me, oh, they had this, make sure you eat very well. And they were like, every time they would be like uh, doing glances. Uh, and I'm like, there is just something wrong. Yeah. Here. And, and, and how that, that is how they broke the news. And a few few days later, I flew in Kenya, into Kenya to, to attend uh, my brother's funeral. And while, and I think I write about, about that situation um, that for me, it was the lowest point ever. I've never gotten that low in my life. Um, so at, at home, and I think in many communities in Kenya, if not Africa, we are very communal. So there were people streaming in and out throughout that week we, I was yeah. at home. And then the only time I actually go to process the the fact that my brother was no longer there is after I left for the UK. And all of a sudden it was tending towards winter because I went back sometime in, I think September. I can't remember very well. It's starting to be colder. And then it's mostly, people are mostly busy. I don't know, it's just, there is, there is just less communal, whatever compared to Kenya. And now that is when I broke down. And I remember I went to the lab one day because also, and, and I was saying, do, don't rush the morning process mm -hmm. because I did try, I tried to, to rush and it's not my fault. It's just because the PhD is just this cloud that is constantly hanging <laughs> over, over Christmas, over New Year. It's just there. It's just there. Like there are things to be done, things to be corrected. Like it's just this thing. And I remember taking, I, I had taken one month off and I was just feeling guilty that my PhD is kind of lagging behind. I need to finish, my money's running out and all that. And so I rushed and I went back to the lab and someone, someone just asked me, are you, are you, are you um, submitting a journal or a conference paper this year? And I just broke down. I just remembered, oh my God, there is a journal paper to be submitted. I don't feel like, I, I wanted people to pity me. And sometimes like people just didn't understand because sometimes it's hard to understand if you've not gone through that journey. Yeah. And I just broke down. And I remember just my adv advisor saying, you know, take extra days, just go home, sleep, you know. And I took some time, but definitely it was like the lowest moment. And 
the reason why I chose to share is just to say, and like you had correctly mentioned, the life uh, life is not posing for you to do the PhD. Yeah. So it's just whatever, whatever good or bad, things will happen. And just recognize that it's part of life. It's hard. Go through the phases. Don't rush it. And, and ask for help while you're going through those uh, sad moments of heartbreak or, or losing loved ones, ETC. And then um, I hope you emerge out of it and you look at the positive side. So for me, for instance, uh, when, when I saw my brother being lowered down into the grave, I just remembered all these dreams he used to tell us. And now they were not going to see the light of day. Like those dreams were actually going with him. And it was the saddest moment for me. And I think from, and I write in the book, these books for sure, 100%, they were not going to happen if it wasn't, if it that wasn't that sense. moment. Yes, uh, realizing that we don't have entire time here on earth. We could be here today. We are not there tomorrow. So yeah. as, as, as soon as you can, as early as possible, whatever dream of yours, yeah. start it. Yeah. Answer, start it, just start it, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes, wow. Yes. wow, that's really profound. And uh, yeah, we thank God at least you emerged victorious at the end. I mean, very many good things have come out. And maybe Gladys, uh, probably the final question is, I know you share so many things in your book, the PhD journey, and we're going to tell people how they can get it. But maybe your top three tips for a PhD student, I mean, anywhere, whether in Kenya, in the UK, in the US, what are the, what would you say these are? Some of the things, I know there are so many and actually very useful I have annotated in the book uh, that you can share with those who are watching. Oh, That is excellent. for successful completion of your PhD. Yeah. <laughs> the okay. tips, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, all right. Three things, and, and, and for those who have the book already, I asked 15 friends of mine to also mm -hmm. share their three tips. And it was so amazing. It's yeah. the favorite chapter, favorite chapter of, of the book, actually, just reading through what people suggest as their top three things. Actually, they say top three things they wish they knew before they started their PhD. Yes, yes. They are really powerful. Mm -hmm. So for me, if you are a prospective student, a prospective PhD student, or an ongoing, or even masters, actually. I think some of these things will, will At across. catch across. Yeah. Yeah. So top three things. The first one is, and we talked about mm. it, imposter syndrome is constant. Just get used to it. Just be immune to imposter syndrome and maybe pay attention to tips and tricks that we shared on how to survive it or how to mitigate or how to keep marching forward regardless of that. So just know that fear and imposter syndrome and insecurities are going to be constant. That is number one. Number two is inspiration is perishable. Mm -hmm. I didn't like this because, I didn't like this because, and any PhD student will tell you, like some days I'll be watching a movie and then while watching a movie and like we mentioned, PhDs is a cloud, it's with you. When you are enjoying your Netflix, <laughs> it's just here, yeah, it's just here. Yeah. Sorry. So sometimes I would watch a movie, an idea comes up related to my PhD, and I'm so excited. But I'm like, you know, um, let me finish the movie and then maybe work on it tomorrow. By tomorrow, it's gone. That mm -hmm. is gone. Like the inspiration and the, and the fire, the fire that was burning in you, it's gone. So anyway, every time, and, and, and this is not only for PhD related things, but also outside your PhD. If you want to start, if you want to join a club yeah. to do athletics, to start, um, I, start um, I started a, an NGO while I was doing my PhD. I just, they do. And if you say, let's wait until I finish my PhD so that I work on it, it will be gone. It will be long gone. So what, if possible, if time allows and if situation allows, whatever your hobby or whatever your dream or whatever you want to start, when you get that idea, when you get the fire, just commit yourself, start it, yeah. start, don't wait for too long. Yeah. yeah, don't put all your things hold for mm -hmm. you to finish your PhD. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Let it, you, let it yeah. roll in tandem with other things in your life. Be it, I don't know, in whatever you, whatever you, whatever your spheres of life, uh, of life are, let them roll together. Number three is that it's okay to change your mind. So when I started my PhD, my PhD was to become a professor. And I think at that time I left JQuart to go to UK to do my PhD because I knew it would like fast track me to getting that professorship job or, 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 or title. And then just along the way, things just kind of changed. And I remember, and, and, and I remember so right now I'm going to, to do, I'm, I'm kind of branching out of academia and I'm going into management consulting, which is kind of business-ish. And my friends were like, why do PhD in aerospace and then do management consulting? Like they just don't make sense. And I'm like, also, they also don't make sense to me. But like <laughs> right now, right now, that is what my heart wants. And that is mm-hmm. what my, my intuition and everything else is kind of inching me to try, Once, right? Yeah. And yeah. I don't know if it is the right choice. I, I don't know. But I think in this life, or what I'm appreciating is that in this life, we are here to explore, to make mistakes, like to make calculated risks, to, to take calculated risks, etc. So yeah. anyway, when you do a PhD in, I don't know, in communication, in engineering, in biology, at the end of it, if it's no longer speaking to you, it's all right. Take a pause. Go to industry, start a startup, do something else, or go to a system professorship job. Whatever it is, it's okay to change your mind. Life yeah. was meant to be explored, and 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 it's okay to take these calculated risks, and yeah, and 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 get that adrenaline. <laughs> so, top three things is imposter syndrome and insecurities are common and uh-huh. constant. Just be immune. Or look for strategies to 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 stay alive. And the spark or the fire comes, don't don't push it. Don't wait for too long. It will be gone. And then it's okay to change your mind, career or non-career. Yeah. Wow. 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 I think I just advise the people to get the book for. For more tips, you know, maybe you can advise us where can they get the book in those who are interested in getting this book. I know it's on Amazon, which is one of the places, but those who are interested in getting physical books, especially in Kenya or elsewhere, maybe you can tell us and the cost. All right, all right, all right. So in Kenya, let mm. me start with in Kenya, you can... I think the easiest way for, for people in Kenya, if you can drop me a message on WhatsApp, and mention that you got to know about this book through this session. What do you call it again? Ben? PhD stories, PhD stories. PhD stories, yes. Yeah. So mention that you got to know about the PhD journey through this uh, PhD stories uh, Zoom session. Yeah. And um, the WhatsApp number um, is 0797417700. And I'll share with you, Harry, and yeah. you can share so for people in kenya just drop me that whatsapp message and we can organize details on how you can get it it's a two thousand shillings in kenya and also you can dm me on social media pages if you go to linkedin facebook instagram or twitter look for gladys jepiriniatich or gladys niatich or dr gladys niatich i think you will you'll find me uh, or actually the easiest way is if you can go to my website which is uh, gladyschepkirui.com you will get my links to social media there or even you can contact me through the contact form there yeah. and anyone else who is able to able to get from Amazon Kindle or get a um, uh, you can okay so you can actually just Google or and just go to Google and just say the PhD journey by Gladys Yetich and it will give you it will give you like different retail stores or bookshops where you can get depending on where you are but i think the the common one that many people like to use is amazon so on amazon just go to amazon type the phd journey by gladys Nyatich, 
and you'll see it there. On to, uh, it should be top of the results when you when you when you type the PhD journey and then add my name, and then you can get a physical copy or an ebook or Kindle. If you have yeah. Kindle, I think that is actually the way to get it as well. Yeah. Wow, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Gladys. And I think uh, here's the book. So we just want to also give some little offer for those, maybe probably the first 10, 20 people who are watching and who are interested in getting some 500 shillings off, you know. You can mention <laughs> PhD stories that you watched from the, you know, this recording or this show, and then you'll be able to get some discount in getting the books. Um, others, uh, Dr. Harry, we're so grateful, you know, to have you this one, uh, it's been so great learning a lot. And I'm sure those who are going to get the book, they will learn even more. Prospective students, current students, and that's what I'm saying. Please like, share with someone that you know is interested in doing their PhD, or even you or those you have PhD groups, you know, share with them and it will be helpful. Yeah, any last, yeah. last, last, last thing in less than a minute? No, thank you. Thank you so much. You are doing amazing. This is an amazing platform. This is a platform I wish I knew, or I wish they, they were at that time. I'm not sure if they were, maybe they were, but I was not aware. But it's really important for people to hear diverse stories on how people went through or approached their PhDs, just so that you have some information on how you can go about yours. So well done for the good platform. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Ari. All the best in your endeavors, in your assignments that you're taking up next. Yeah, thank keep, going. You. keep inspiring many. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. I think we'll put it on end here. Yeah. All right. Time. Cheers. Okay. Yeah.